Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Soul of the United Methodist Church on this uh, cloudy day, and there's a little bit of a storm that seems to be picking up around here in Iowa, so I'm sure the traveling is going to be a little tricky today. So, announcements on this wonderful day that we've been given to worship our God and to be together in fellowship, whether or not online or here in person. Um, I have uh, just Thankful to be back here in this uh, community. Uh, last week I was in Colorado Springs celebrating a wedding for uh, my nephew. And it was, uh, weather out there in the Colorado Springs area is always, uh, almost always a terrific uh, area out there. In the evening it used to be 25 or 30 during the winter and then in the daytime almost to 60 degrees at times so, and it's sunny. So, and plus you get the added benefit of looking at the mountains all around you. Other than that, I don't have any particular announcements. I know, uh, uh, Phil, you want to come up and, and have an announcement here? Well, good morning. I'm uh, Phil Kikachik with SPRC. Um, I have a hunch that I'll be doing most of this virtually uh, that you'll be listening to with the uh, snow that we had overnight. That limited us a little bit, but uh, again, uh, wanted to just share some information with you. As most of you know, uh, Pastor Lisa uh, took on a new appointment in uh, Northeast uh, Iowa that she'll be handling the Aurora and Lamont and the Strawberry Point churches. So along with uh, losing uh, Lisa as a associate pastor, we also lost our musical director as well. So the search went out, and uh, as the old saying goes, when uh, one door closes, another one opens. And I think that was the case in this, uh, this particular time. It was an opportunity knocked uh, for our church, and we had an applicant here that uh, uh, was able to uh, respond. And she not only has roots in Solon, but she also has roots uh, in our church. Uh, has a passion for music, has done this uh, for many years, also with teaching. Uh, so it's just a, uh, a great match. Uh, we were able to uh, interview her uh, with some members of SBRC and some members of uh, the choir and, and also Pastor Ken as well. And um, I think it, it took me all of about five minutes to, to, to call her right after that. So uh, without further ado, I wanted to introduce you to our new musical director, who is uh, Angie Grecian Francis. Really glad to be back here and glad to be in the church. So thank you. Let 
us continue um, with our ascension, shall we? This morning, Psalm number 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim and follow you as you would a leaning wall or a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood, and they bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they come up. When they are together lighter, Put no confidence in exhortation, and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to your Lord. For you repay to all according to Our prayers for today, our pastoral prayer and our Lord's Prayer, prayers that you might have this morning. Yes. For my sister-in-law, Stephanie, who had um, really um, her heart rebuilt at Mayo in December, and her recovery is just not going as quickly as she would like. She feels wonderful, but um, her kidneys shut down from being on heart bypass for so long, 
was supposed to start up again, but it's taking a long time, so she's on dialysis, and it, it, she just wants things to progress. So prayers for Stephanie. All right, for Stephanie, continue to heal. Other prayers, yes, sir. Uh, several prayers for my uh, uh, extended family. Uh, Laura, uh, she lost her husband Todd um, uh, this past week uh, to cancer. He's had a long, long battle with that. So just uh, prayers for her and her family. Uh, they have two grown kids, but it's, it's still, you know, it's pretty tough. Uh, also, our uh, oldest son celebrated his birthday this week. I think it's 35. So and I'm only 40. So. <laughs> administration uh, coming in um, I guess uh, very successful and they have some good cooperation uh, from the government level and uh, also uh, just prayers I, uh, you know, back in the, in the days growing up uh, we had several idols and I lost one of mine this past week with uh, Hank Aaron uh, he was my favorite baseball player growing up and um, it, was, it was fun to go get the little those leather bats with the names on them He was just a great individual. I read his books and all the adversity he had to overcome growing up in, the, in that era uh, and just overcame that. And um, by all accounts, just a wonderful individual on and off the field. So. All right. Other prayers this morning we might have. Yes. Um, Shelly Kramer's dad had brain surgery on Wednesday and now headaches. Pray for his recovery. say prayers for the uh, travel that uh, everyone's going to be doing in the area. Just be careful the next couple of days or so. And I know for the online version of this, I've read different critiques that you shouldn't be mentioning what's going on in your particular area, but um, I'm going to, and I just did. So um, I realize that somebody's going to be watching us perhaps at a later time, and I realize that here in the midst of a little bit of a, of a snow out there, and so it'll be a little tricky. So Nevertheless, just be careful and be uh, be wise out there, not only for yourself, but for the other drivers as well. So let us continue in the spirit of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the glory and the blessings of this day. Another day of opportunity for each and every one of us to recognize and to lift up the blessings of life that is just bursting forth around us. We ask for the prayers of comfort and strength for the drivers and the movers moving around today, moving snow for us, and as if we need to be going somewhere for us as well, that we are being uh, wise and, and careful in our travel and our journey. And we lift up some of the prayers as well for our family and friends as they journey through life and all of the challenges that face each of them as individuals and as families. One of the main reasons that we do lift up prayers, dear God, you know, is our, our affinity for community, our feelings for others, and that is a blessing that you have given to us, a care, not only for ourselves, but for family, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, and uncles, and beyond. Dear God, as we move forward this day from this time of worship, we ask you to move and walk with us as we journey forth and be always with us in the blessing and the hope as we seek to find guidance and strength in our Savior and in our King who talked to us a prayer that we still remember to this very day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily prayer and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning, Gospel according to St. Mark, 
chapter 1, verses 12 to 20. Now, prior to this particular passage, the beginning of the good news starts out in chapter 1 of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaks of the prophet Isaiah, about sending a messenger, who was John the Baptist, and John appeared, and John prepared him. Now, Jesus came to John, his cousin, traveling from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized by him in the Jordan. And when he came up, a voice from heaven said, You are my son, beloved, with you I'm well pleased. And this is how it begins today. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited upon him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying that the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And as he went a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. May God add his blessing to this, the hearing of his word. Amen. Calling and mending nets. Calling. We've heard some about that already today. Lisa moving on to another appointment here in the Iowa Annual Conference, as we clergy types do, but not just us, but also a new music person by the name of Angie that I am looking forward to getting to know and not many of you already know. It's the way life works, isn't it? It is. You're called and you move and we move and we're called and along the way we are asked to mend things, to repair things. Sometimes of our own creation but sometimes more than that. Right now, there is much going on in the world around us. As Phil lifted up in prayer earlier today, prayers for our new president, Biden, and for our former president, Trump. We know as a nation and as a world, we are facing much turmoil and much discussion about what should and shouldn't be done. And we in the church face those same kinds of challenges. How should the church move forward? How can the church move forward? Still in the midst of the pandemic, I stand here in the pulpit of the Solely United Methodist Church in front of about nine people, and I'm not sure how many might be watching online, but it is not the same. We know that. And it's not going to be the same ever again. That's the reality that we are facing. It really is. So we are faced with a, with a challenge to face our own self. What is the church? Truly, what is the church? Is it a gathering around the cameras, the screens? Is it a gathering in the sanctuary? Is it a gathering in the kitchen? Is it a gathering in the backyard or in the front yard? What is the church? Some of us have our own preconceived ideas and notions about what is the church. Not unlikely, an individual by the name of Jonah that many of us have heard rumors of, and perhaps a little bit of stories of, but we're not quite sure exactly who Jonah was. Well, let me give you a little, little taste of, of who Jonah was. According to the book of Jonah, in chapter 3, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and said to get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it, a message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city. Three days of walk across it. 
And Jonah began to go into the city a day's walk, and he cried out. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast. And everyone put on sackcloth, and they changed their ways. And when God saw what they had done, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. He didn't do it. Jonah wasn't happy. You would think that a prophet might have been happy that the people had changed, but in this case, Jonah was not happy. Jonah was almost seen to be, according to the story, looking forward to the punishment that the people of Nineveh were going to receive. I've been witness to that kind of mentality for a number of weeks now, and I know you have as well. People have seemed to look upon others almost with a, a vengeance, almost with a desire of pain. And I don't care what position you find yourself in in this world, that should be a problem for you. It should be a deep problem for you to wish ill and harm to any person. Is that what Jesus taught to us? I thought Jesus taught to us that we are to be a people of forgiveness, a people of repentance and of hope, remembering that all of us fall short of the glory of God, except for Christ himself. Our call, my sisters and brothers, our call from God is to witness hope and love. Behind me here in this particular sanctuary is the fire station for the soul of And a lot of it is manned by volunteers, which reminds me of the story that I came across of a local fire station in Pennsylvania a number of years ago. And outside, an advertisement for volunteers. The sign reads as follows. Members wanted, cool hat, sweet ride, no pay, and very often. Now that was a great humorous way, and I'm sure the solo firefighters over here could do the same thing. They've got a cool hat, they got some sweet rides over there, but they've got some really odd hours. We, we in the church have, I suppose, the same kind of, of weirdness to us. And that's why this, this that's why it caught my attention. The church has always been a challenge for us as members and as people who walk together with different people, people that aren't the same as us, and yet we are all trying to find this God, this King, this Creator that, that put us together. And He calls to each of you, each of us, all of us, to follow. But all of us have a little bit different take on Teacher and theologian Frederick Buechner wrote this a number of years ago, that a woman who was sitting nearby him said to him when he was starting off in his ministry call, he said, I hear you're entering in ministry, she said to him. Was it your own idea or were you poorly advised? He never forgot what that he said. His own idea or was he poorly advised? He knew already that the church is not always a place of comfort. A place of challenge is what we find in the church. It's challenging because we get to engage ourselves with people who are different than we are. And we are brought to a point where we need to reflect upon our own eyesight, our own vision, as opposed to the other people that we interact with. But that's a strength that always has been a strength because we begin to expand our vision, our view of the world and of God, our Creator. We begin to listen more intently. Because each of us brings something different to the table. I gave you an example. 
this is not just within the church. This is just a faith tradition, okay? It was a kindergarten teacher that read about it. She gave her class a show-and-tell assignment. Each student was instructed to bring an object to class to share that represented his or her religious tradition that they had one. Well, the first student got up in front of the class and said, my name is Benjamin, and I'm Jewish. This is the Star of David. The second student got up in front of the class and said, my name is Mary, I'm, I'm Roman Catholic, and this is the Rosary. The third student got up in front of the class and said, my name is Tommy, and I'm a United Methodist, and this is a casserole. <laughs> now, of course, that's humorous, and it's intended to be humorous, and other churches can do it, but this is a stereotypical kind of mindset that we sometimes get into with our faith traditions and how we identify and how children None of those things are, are bad or good, it's bad, that's just the way it is. But again, we need to ask ourselves, what is our faith tradition? What is it that identifies us as a follower of our God or King? For us, as United Methodists at this particular church, what is it that drives us, moves us, calls us forward? What is it? What calls us beyond these ideas of stereotypes that we sometimes build and create around us? And I've never been a fan of saying who is or who is not a, a follower of Christ. I have been told that within this particular um, IO annual conference, I guess my reputation precedes me with some of the folks, um, other clergy types that, that I read as I refer to ourselves, that uh, I don't like labels, and, and I don't. I don't like labels at all. They irritate the heck out of me because it categorizes people and it limits people. I do not like labels. I never have. But Benjamin Corey came up with a little bit of a list that I find that I can receive openly. How to spot the follower of Jesus. Now, this is not the end all, but he came up with five little points. I think we're pretty good. A Jesus follower likes to talk about him, but doesn't in such a way that it causes you to want to know him more, not less. Number two, a follower of Jesus embraces the enemy love. Loving those even though they view themselves to be an enemy of that other thing. Number three, a Jesus follower is one who is full of compassion for the outsiders. And the Jesus follower, number four, is the one who is quickest to show others mercy. The quickest to show mercy. And as number five, Benjamin Corey writes, a Jesus follower is the one who, when they describe what God is like, describe Jesus. One of the things that this last few months have driven deep into the hearts of everyone has been our need to repent, I believe, and to change how we see others. Everything I still see and read constantly, we need to change how we look at others. We have become, in some cases, That is to be the body of Christ and not just a business, a living, breathing body, an organism, if you will, not just an organization. Sure, we need business smarts and we need organizational skills and talents, but we need to understand that the church is a living, breathing, changing body of people. Shake the old. Never forgetting the past, but always pressing forward into the future. A future that is challenging everywhere. And as we do move forward, 
want to leave a little bit of a story with you. You might know the man, man by the name of Will Campbell. He was a Baptist from Mississippi who went to Yale Divinity School. His family home church had Bibles with the symbol of the Ku Klux Klan inscribed on them, but the adult Campbell became known for his civil rights activism so much so that he received countless death threats. It was dangerous for him to return home, but at one very low time in his life, he did. His 12-year-old nephew had died after being hit by a car while riding a bicycle that his uncle had given to him. Now the tradition for the family was that someone would keep a vigil with the body at the funeral home, and that task fell to Will Campbell. He sat in the funeral home after calling hours had ended, alone with his grief and his sorrow at the loss of his 12-year-old nephew. He said at 3 o'clock in the morning, he felt the presence of someone else. And another person moved It was his favorite uncle, a man he had not seen for many, many years, because the uncle had become Campbell's most severe critic of his activism. Campbell said he looked at his uncle's face, didn't say anything, nor did his uncle, and they sat there together, mixed. Looking back on it, Campbell wrote, Until the dawn, I sat in the redemptive company of the racist Jesus. A couple of observations. A racist provides the redemptive company with a cup of coffee. There's silver rights. civilized activist, a hostile preacher that convinced to the people of his first of his family. How could any of that work? But it did. On that night, two men with very, very different views of life sat together as family. say that there is talk of the impending death of the church. The church universal is dying. Look at the membership. Look at the attendance. It's declined and declined. The death of church. It's a misnomer. The church is not dying. The church is never going to die. The church is the body of Christ. Now what the church is going to look like how we will manifest ourselves in the body of Christ as the people and the children of God, that remains to be determined because it is determined by our decisions, our choice to share and to give what has been given to us. The love of God. No matter how 
modern we may think ourselves to be. Speaking to a group of people in pews or speaking to people over a microphone and a camera. The church remains the church, a community. A community of people that seek to sit together, perhaps with a thermos of coffee, or tea, or a soda, whatever it might be, and sit together. Jesus calls us. As we move forward into the day, as we move forward into the week before us, I ask you to move with grace and mercy and care for those around you. Be attentive and be careful about who you engage with and how you engage with them. And always in every way, go in grace, go in peace, in the name of the Father and of the Son.